Hello there. My name is Phil Williams and I would like to welcome you to Audio Angling, the podcast site of fishingfilmsandfacts.co.uk. Back in 1954, using a piece of bicycle inner tube and an English-made spinner blade called the Vibro, Morris Clarkson made himself one of the most iconic spinning lures ever designed, the Flying Sea and ever since has been designing, manufacturing and marketing a huge range of handcrafted lures across a very wide spectrum of forms and designs. Everything from wooden devons and metal spoons to latex bodied spinners at his aptly named Spintech premises at Ribchester in Lancashire. And now in 2012, and still using some of the antiquated machinery by the looks of things too, his lure making continues to thrive. I've used the Flying Sea on many occasions over the years, both in freshwater for pike and at sea for bass, and as such can appreciate why it stood the test of time to become one of the most readily identifiable designs in lure making history. So what better place to start? The Flying Sea is roughly about 100 years old. It was around the 19, 1900 turn of the century. It was a, a Russian angler who used to go to Ireland and he patented it in Ireland. This is when Ireland was part of the United Kingdom. But it wasn't the same as today. It was more of a, a spinner like a, a Devon with the latex tails on. The first known flying sea of today is probably 1950. One or two rivers used to use the Vibro and they used to put uh, latex tails on, or should I say, rubber, which they had from uh, cycling in the tubes. So that's one of the earliest ones. It is a, a vibro with rubber from a cycle in the tube. And it got very, very popular, more popular probably in 1995, 96, when we started to manufacture latex tubing. The colours is unlimited. I think we have about 45 colours of the Flying Sea. And because it's very easy to make, just like fly tying, a lot of people now make their own flying seas and this is why it's come very, very popular and you can actually make a good quality flying sea as little as £1.25. So essentially, the flying sea is a long-standing lure pattern which to a large extent you've stuck with since the mid-1950s and more recently, for want of a better word, reinvented. Yeah, the flying sea is, is so popular, it's cheap to produce yourself, the range of colours which you have and actually it catches fish. It is suggested that the longer the tail you have, the better the chances. Now we use the latex one, now the latex tail you can cut it longer because it's higher strength. And the species of fish it regularly catches are? Basically, any predatory fish what eats another fish. The range is it's absolutely unlimited. Sea fishing, we haven't anybody who's caught a shark with it yet, but there's certainly red snappers, no problem. Well, I can most certainly vouch for its sea fishing credentials, having taken 64 bass in a single session at Heesham a couple of years ago, using a small yellow-tailed version. That is very, very good. I've been to Heesham myself, and it, to me it's like a river coming out there from the nuclear power plant, and uh, it is very, very good if one wanted to spin. I haven't been spinning in the sea, I'm not uh, a sea fisher. What is it then that makes it such a successful design? I think it's the tails actually, everyone said the vibrating tails, the longer the tails we found it's the better one, but even then if the tails of uh, we'll say silicones have pulled off one can still catch one or two salmon, but I think we're the only manufacturer in the world who are making a tube, this is latex, and this has a domed head so it, it doesn't slip over the lead barrel. It's very very easy to, to make, I think the most tricky part is probably cutting of the tails. But actually, up to date, we've actually uh, manufactured now over one million. Now, obviously, the Flying Sea is not the only quality product to come out of Spintech. But before we get too deeply into the technicalities of lure design, manufacturing and choice, I'd like you to go back to those very earliest of your lure making days, before the concept of Spintech was even dreamed up. So how did you get interested in lure design in the first place, then progress it through to where we are today? Well, I think most people used to make their own lures out of spoons. The earliest record I have is going fishing with my dad when he just come out of the last war. Then after that, I seem to have a recollection going down to Ribchester around 1953-54. And when we got there, the river was polluted and I saw my first salmon, which I thought it was a monster at the time, but probably only eight or nine pounds. 
So from that day, I've always been interested in fishing. And like anything else, we started off with a worm, progress to spinning, and then on to fly fishing. Now, I know that when river conditions dictate, you put a lot of time in salmon fishing using the lures you designed and made yourself. So what's the secret behind designing not so much a good lure, but a great lure? And why are your lures better than the rest? But it's like a, a, a fly tyre. What makes him think the East fly is better than a boat one? Because he makes it to his satisfaction. And he probably put a little bit more dressing in it and make it to his liking. So the spinners which we had, apart from the, the Vibo, which was an excellent spinner, which was made in uh, the UK, we decided only 14 years ago to make tubes. No one had made a tube with a dome head. It was extruded normal, the latex tubing or silicone tubing, which is very, very easy to make on an extruding machine, but latex is a little bit more complicated and it's very low technology. Back in those earliest of days, you presumably wouldn't have had the range of machinery available today. Though it's worth pointing out that some of the machines and gadgets currently in use here at Spintech are even older than you. What then are your earliest recollections of making lures for sale? I was making my own flying seas out of these tubes and one or two friends of mine suggested why don't they go into manufacturing the latex tubes as these were better colours, the tails could be cut longer, they didn't split like silicone so that's how we started to manufacture so actually we turned over from making latex moulds which we did, we used to do garden moulds, figurine moulds, chest moulds and we turned over and now the business is 95% are making uh, lures and over the last few years when one or two people have stopped making fishing lures such as uh, the blur spoon we took over the plant and the machinery and uh, we've just grown from there. With a primary focus both as a lure maker and an angler being salmon. Yeah, I've always wanted to do uh, sea fishing but the coast of Lancashire is a lot of sand and I, I do like to get into the rocks if it's a possibility. If I was a Welshman then I'd be doing a little bit of both because the coast in Wales is very very good. If the rivers are down they have a tendency to go into the sea on these small rivers and uh, it's certainly very good to do that. Can you fill in a bit more detail now bridging the gap between those humble beginnings and where we find ourselves here today? Just manufacturing black tubing, red tubing, yellow tubing and purple tubing and put in an advert in the trout and salmon and from that day it's just snowballed. The first year we might have only sold one to two hundred tubes but now uh, our second million it will probably be achieved in well it was ten years to do the first million it probably only be about three and a half years to do the second million. It's people that once, once they've used it they're coming back and they're catching fish from it. It does take a lot of fish and now we're starting to export all over the world some orders have gone out to uh, Russia this week and there's no country which we don't sell to especially if there's salmon and sea trout in them rivers. The range of lures as evidenced by the display in the reception area is also very impressive in terms of size, colours and patterns. Well we make uh, Devon minnows, we make spoons, we have our own machinery and most of this machinery, well in fact all the machinery is UK made. We have the Fells lathe, which is a copy lathe which we make the demons from. People think it was made up in Kendall. And we have the Britain lathe, which we use for uh, turning things out, such as the bullets for the new flying seas. We've also got a fly press. <laughs> Turn off one at a time. <laughs> yeah, we have a fly press. This is a Norton fly press, 8 ton. We're using genuine copper and we're going up to uh, 60 gram lures now. This is the new blur spoon which is done extremely well and we're making one for the sea and it's a 60 gram weight and we haven't even started on the, the sea fishing. We think uh, the sea fishing actually is a bigger industry than what we'll say for salmon fishing or trout fishing by spinning. And besides the wide range of patterns available on your website, which is www.spintech.co.uk, you also sell the component parts loose to the public for home completion. Do you not find that this leaves you open to requests for personalised specific one-offs, particularly from people visiting the workshop and seeing what's on offer? Yeah, we do uh, personalise uh, Lewis for customers. 
Uh, red seems to do good on one river and black on the other and red and black on another one. So therefore we make spinners to your specifications providing we have the components in which we seem to have. I think we're the only people in the country where we have the French blade from size naught right up to the size 8. And you also manufacture and supply many component parts to commercial outlets such as fishing tackle shops. Do you not find this undermines the core business to any extent? No, not really. We'd need a work staff of 20 or 30 we were making Lewis. And uh, people like making it. I mean, you might as well say with the, the people who sell fly tying equipment, let them tie their own flies. The hardcore people would like to make their own lure. And believe me, when you've made your own lure and you catch your first salmon, you really appreciate it. What well, if someone hits upon a possible solution for a problem that you don't already have covered? Have you ever been asked to personalise your lure making to that extent? We certainly would uh, try to uh, personalise a lure because we've got all the equipment to do so. We have personalised a lot of colours which people have because we've gone on to pearlescence etc. The colours is absolutely unlimited. All's what you have to do, watch all these cars go back and we can make any flying sea to that colour if, if you'd like. So it's all done using auto paints? It certainly is auto paint, not only that, it's water based auto paint. The very few cellulose paints are now made and uh, we're all going over to the uh, water based acrylic paints. Now you said earlier that all predatory fish are likely targets, but who do you see as your main angling target for the range of lures you currently market? We make a lure and we don't bother what the cost is going to be. This lure has to be 100%. There's no short corners. All our blur spoons, they all have ball bearing swivels. A normal barrel swivel, as far as I'm concerned, it's a, it's a no go in this day and age. I take it that's down to the fact that anglers spinning with normal barrel swivels can waste precious time they'd usually paid a lot of money for, which for the sake of an extra 50 pence on the price of a lure to fit it with a BB swivel could have been avoided. Yeah, the ball bearing swivel, one of the most known ball bearing swivel is the Sharps BB. Now this hasn't been made by Sharps for over 30 years. It was made by a gentleman in Aberdeen and his wife, Mr George Middleton. Uh, I believe that Mrs Middleton used to work for Sharps and when she retired she was offered that she could take this home. So for the last 25-30 years uh, Mr Middleton and his wife have been making the ball bearing swivels and three years ago he retired and we was very very interested in making these and we did visit to see how they are made and to probably buy all his components and his machinery to make these. It's very low technology but the parts was actually made in Thurso in Scotland and the gentleman on his CNC machine he also wanted to retire so therefore we had to be withdrawn to making BBs. So as far as I know at the moment uh, there's only four people who can make these BBs in the United Kingdom. That's Mr. Middleton, his wife, and myself and my partner. It was eventually sold back to Sharps, and I believe now they are made in China. And they're actually costing more from China to import back into the UK than Mr. Middleton uh, and his wife were uh, charging. It was little cottage industry. So what hard evidence is there out there to support the cost implications here? All our lures are based first on quality. We don't take something off to make it cheaper. We make something far, far better. Now, we use ball bearing swivels. Now, because you use ball bearing swivels, you can come straight from the reel right to the flying sea or the blur spoon, etc. And you have only one knot. To me, one knot is far, far better than having three knots. And not only that, if your friend, if you, you we your friend, and he's spinning at the same time with a barrel swivel, I'm afraid if you're both fishing four hours, he's only fishing two and you're fishing four. So you've more chance of catching fish if, if you were actually fishing longer than your friend due to entanglements and it not uh, spinning or it's not fluttering correctly. I believe you also market another method of getting around the problem of line twist by manufacturing both left and right handed spinning Devons. Our forefathers, I'll tell you something, we've not invented anything what they didn't think of before. They actually had the flying sea years and years ago, it's just a natural improvement. 
They used to make Devons which was left-handed and right-handed. This is because the swivels, even the bevel swivels 100 years ago was better than the bevel swivels they are today. They used to spin 5 or 10 minutes left hand and then 5 or 10 minutes right hand. This was to untangle the line when they were spinning. By using the uh, ball bearing swivels you eliminate a lot of time and also, like, like I say, like, more time you have on the water fishing and you catch more fish. Now I don't want you to take this next comment the wrong way, but all of this quality is achieved using machines which to me look like they could be museum pieces. It actually reminds me a bit of Fred Dibner, the Bolton Bay steeplejack, who was always on the TV renovating really old, highly effective machinery. Yeah, we're fishermen, we don't want to get into engineering, we just want to engineer fishing products, we don't want to make other things. Now if we had to get uh, more advanced machinery, then, like I said, we'd have to go into other types of uh, manufacturing. Low technology, these machines are only working one day a week because the industry doesn't warrant it. If we had a CNC machine, I'm afraid we'd have to go off fishing. We'd only use it <laughs> one week in a year and we'd have to take outside work on other components which are not connected to the fishing industry. The fly press we have is an Orton fly press 8 ton. It's uh, nearly 100 years old, but the fly press has been around from the ancient Egyptians. Antiquated, yeah, but cost effective and versatile too. On top of which, small batches or even individual lures can be made. Yeah, I just go and swing the fly press, might just run 50, 60 off. To make a spoon, first of all we want the copper. We cut the copper into strips so that it will go into the fly press. When we stamp them out then, we have to stamp out the holes. We have to put either scale markings on, but our main one is the blur spoon where we have the pimples. The pimple patterning on the blur spoon is the main distinguishing feature between it and most of the other lures. What difference do you feel this makes to its attraction from a fish's point of view? I believe, uh, going back to the whole people who used to use these many, many years ago, it was the reflection of the pimples actually standing proud of the blade and this is supposed to be very good for the reflection rather than say we'll test scales we can put a scale on the same one but it doesn't probably have the same reflection as the pimples there have also been manufacturing concessions to the 21st century too you work with different colours of latex being one of them prior to what we'll say 95 96 they were using silicone tubing and they were using rubber tubing which probably from the hospitals but we're the first one to make the dome head. So that means there's only a hole and one end, and this is where we cut the tails. What qualities does latex bring that rubber can't match? Silicone, if you dig it in the ground, it lasts forever and ever and ever, but it's not an high tensile material. It splits very, very easy. You can't get a very, very good tail. You could actually stretch a latex tail probably six times the length of what you're cutting, where a silicone one will just snap off within half its length. On top of which, because you produce the tails as separate items, if you did damage one you could presumably replace it. That's right, uh, basically you can rebuild them. You can use the spoons, the, the oak, the beads etc. Or if you want to replace the, the oak you can do so. It's just at the expense of the wire. If the tube is bitten off by uh, we'll say pike etc, there's nothing to stop you cutting the wire and building it back up for a fraction of the original cost. What about the range of colour variations? Colour of the rainbow and beyond. Black and red, black and blue, you name it, we do it. That's why we have 45 colours. We can do metallics, we can do the natural latex, we can do two colour latex, we also can do the, what we call the genie. This is where one colour is on the outside and a different colour inside. So when the fish is following this, behind the lure, it can see a different colour as it chases the lure. And I've noticed you also incorporate the dual colour effect on your metal spoons too. Presumably, this is done by plating. We make these lure spoons, we've just fetched this back. This was a company over in Scarborough, it was Mr Irving Waterhouse. He probably made the finest lures that ever has been made in this country. We got all the machinery off him when he retired and we make the blower spoons. We do the blower spoons out of pure copper. We sell them in pure copper or we plate one side which is nickel silver. 
and the other side is then it's copper so we've got copper uh, nickel silver or all copper now we can do also colored ones such as we can spray them uh, different colors but we found out that the original blur spoon is the one that most people do use and for that you have a little purpose-built spray booth yeah the spray booth that that was another one from Irving Waterhouse it takes all the fumes out but uh, these days we're using water-based paints so therefore if somebody comes to us with we'll say an order of 10 Devons and he wanted a certain color I just send him outside and say right tell us what car passes and what colour it is and you can do it because we can actually do a Devon to any colour what's in the automobile industry. I suppose that having lots of small low tech pieces of kit like this gives you a very distinct advantage over the larger companies for whom it would be impossible to work the way you do it. The machine in which we have it's just the same as the machinery which is modern today. The only difference is that it's operated by man other machinery which do the same job is operated by a computer but it's the same tooling a tooling will just say for the blur spoon will probably cost a thousand pounds now we stamp it out with one man in fact our computers can do more than a normal computer because I am the computer and I take it it's advantageous to do it this way yeah if we want to turn out a batch of uh, 100 we turn out a batch of 100 the fly press is no electric so it doesn't use any energy and I can turn out we'll say 40 blur spoons go and turn out 40 Devons a spray 40 Devons etc so it would be very very versatile where if we had computerized one I'm afraid you have to have that machine working 24 7. Sticking with 21st century thinking for the moment some things you could do in terms of product presentation in the past are no longer possible today and I'm thinking here about environmental challenges. The main one being the outlawing of lead on certain waters which you've worked around by producing non-lead bullet heads in nickel, brass and copper finishes for constructing those lures that require them. Yeah, I think we're coming lead free. Uh, the tray seems to be talking about the lead free. But at the moment we're okay because the lead is actually covered by latex. But the same lead which we use in flying seeds cannot be used as a ledger. What about non-lead alternatives now, such as brass? Well, people don't realise that there's lead in brass. The big message coming out of all this for me is that at Spintech, penny pinching is never an option. Yeah, our motto is quality before quantity. That's also reflected in the choice of Eagle Claw straight point bronze trebles. Actually, we would use an English one, but it's not made in this country. And we find out that the uh, Eagle Claw, which comes from America, out of probably half a million which we've sold we haven't had one comeback. So how much extra does quality add to the cost of a lure? Very little, only the price of the material for the component because if a man's making fishing hooks he's still to pay his, his wage whether he makes a good one or a bad one. I started making these lures for myself so therefore if you make something for yourself you actually make a, a better product and I realise now that there weren't so many products about where the, there was concern with the quality they seemed to be it was money wise etc if uh, Mr Dyson made fishing lures he'd call them spin tech with your vast experience of making selling and using lures yourself plus feedback from customers which of your products has been the most successful for you and also for the angler well I have to say it's the new blur tech one the old copper one it's a Toby a flying C and a blur this is the one which I have only just caught my fish of the lifetime 25 pound salmon in October on the river in 2011 a lot of lures which we make have been designed by we'll say the angler himself who's come to see me can I make this lure can I make that lure and I've tried them myself and they've been very very successful we've gone back to have a look at the the Vibro which used to be made in this country and also the Alfax Devon and these were extremely popular in the 50s and 60s. I mean, actually, we've got, uh, we still have one or two Al Alfax Devons, which were, we call them Alfax because they were made probably in Halifax. What is it then that makes some lures work better than others? I think it's the colour variation which you can achieve with a flying sea and the price. You can make a top quality flying sea using latex tubing, uh, a top quality oak for as little as. £1.50. So what part then does colour play in all of this? 
I think you'd have to ask the fish for that. I don't actually know. We had a gentleman on the uh, Ribble. He was a coarse fisherman fishing down at Bottleston. And he was watching salmon fishermen catch salmon spinning the flying sea. And he asked the gentleman, what is that you've got on the end of your line? He said, oh, it's a, it's a flying sea. We're getting from Spintech in Blackburn. This is when we was in Blackburn. So he came to visit us and he was took up with a bright black and yellow fluorescent tail. He loved it. He said, "That's I like that. I said, well, really, it's the salmon you should be asking. And he took ten, and fortnight after he came back, he says, can I have another ten spinners? Oh, I said, sorry that you've lost them all, like. He says, no, he said, but I've caught my first salmon. So for the rest of his life, we'll say he'll always have a black and uh, a fluorescent tail on uh, in, in his box because he, he has caught a salmon on it. Well, that's colour appealing to the angler rather than the fish, which is a confidence issue, though it can help, I suppose, by encouraging people who are confident to fish that much harder. But what about matching colour to conditions rather than angler preference? Well, first of all, you have to make a, a lure which works. Then you have to make it that it's saleable and it's presentable to the fisherman itself. Personally, myself, I like a battered lure, one which has just gone off the shine. It looks like it has been worn. Uh, it's just like when I'm fly fishing. The fly which I've used a, a, a lot of times is battered, uh, it's fallen to pieces, and when I lose it, I put a new one on, and I don't catch the fish. But the old one, there's no fly tire would ever sell a fly in the condition uh, when it's come to the end of its time. But that fly, that's the one what catches the fish. Well, it's the same in lures. I wouldn't be able to sell a battered, uh, we'll say, heavily used flying sea. So it's the angler who buys it, after all, <laughs> not the salmon. I'm thinking here more of turning up on the riverbank and looking into a box of, let's say, brand new lures, then having to select one to tie on. What are the factors coming into play here? Probably something which is bright in dirty water, in clean water something dark. I'd say if it's very, very clean, something like black, and if it's very sandy colour, we want probably yellows and your bright oranges and your reds. What I'd like to do now is for us to turn your attention to the subject of the fishing itself. I know you're a keen salmon fisherman, I also know you spend your working life dealing with salmon lures, but are you actually a lure salmon fisherman yourself? No, I'd, I'd actually describe myself as a, a fly fisherman. Though we started off fishing uh, way back in the 1950s, I lived in Blackburn and we used to walk down to the station half past six on a Sunday morning catch the first buzz out to uh, Brockhall village, this was for the uh, staff of Brockhall and then we walked down to Akin Boat and them days we would fish all the way up to uh, to Clitheroe. Mostly it was spinning but it was spinning the minnow. These days salmon aren't caught regularly enough to rack up huge seasonal or even lifetime totals. But just to throw a few numbers into the frame anyway, how many salmon do you think you've caught over the years on lures and what has been your best? I probably caught uh, 200 fish in my lifetime and that's actually, it's very good because it's been mainly the Ribble. Caught about 10 in Scotland and 2 or 3 in Ireland. I fished in Norway, no results. But on the Ribble, that's my number which we've caught. This is from 1955 and we're talking in the days when there were probably only a thousand fish run the entire system. Now we're talking, getting up to the 12 to 15,000. I think over the next few years we'll get definitely get to 15,000 fish going past uh, Calderfoot. We're getting now some going up the Calder and it's improvement all the, all the time on the river. We're certainly improving whether it's at the expense of the big rivers such as the Tweed and the Tay. Uh, we're quite happy because we're getting our first year now. By comparison to other species, salmon catch rates are always going to be low. So how do you maintain the motivation? What, in your opinion, makes salmon fishing so addictive? Well, personally myself, I, though I like salmon fishing, my greatest is sea trout fishing. I do like fishing in the, in, in the dark. Uh, it's a different environment and you seem to be in a, in a different world. And of course, a five pound sea trout puts a better fight up than a 10 pound salmon. Over the years, I've seen a number of tongue-in-cheek excuse books for salmon anglers, which sadly, in many ways, though they're intended to be a spoof, 
have not been that far from the mark. Things like too much water, not enough water, water too cold or water too warm. I'm sure there'll be times, as with all salmon anglers, when you'll be out on the bank and not even bother to wet a line. Can you explain to us now then why that should be, and what it is that makes even the potential for salmon fishing so difficult? Well, I've caught salmon when I shouldn't have caught salmon, and when the river's been perfect, I've never caught salmon, so I think it should be that way, because if you can go down to the river and just catch a salmon or a sea trout when you want to, I think the enjoyment will be taken out. Let's face it, all what we can do is cut the hours down to catch a salmon or a sea trout. So we try and go down at the time when we think it's perfect or when we've caught other fish. Because if we catch fish, we'll say sea trout fishing at night time, the river's low. It's just come off a flood three days back. It's slightly moonlight with one or two clouds. We catch fish, so we have a tendency for look. Uh, for this mark again the next time we go fishing. Well it's the same in salmon fishing, if the river is in nice uh, nice trim we have a bit of a cloud cover during the daytime and we catch fish and we'll just say uh, this is just from uh, when the river was in flood two days after we have a tendency to go down and do the same. I think me, myself it's what we call a window. If you fish it when a certain window is there you have more chance of catching a fish. I admire these, uh, these Scottish anglers, the, the people who know when to go fishing and when not to go fishing. The first time I fished the, the River Nith up at Thornhill, we arrived at Pen Point there and we uh, was told to go down to go salmon fishing. Now the river was absolutely bank high. We said, well, we never fish in this water. He said, well, go and watch the local anglers. We went down there and there they are, worm fishing, catching salmon. The day after when the river dropped down, they were spinning. The second day they were spinning. The third day they were fly fishing. The fourth day they were fly fishing. And the fifth day, that was it. They was ready for the next flood. So who can I argue with the local anglers who probably catch five or 600 fish in their lifetime? What about non-weather related factors governing numbers of salmon available to anglers? Are they in decline? despite the fact that the Ribble currently seems to be getting a bigger slice these days of the overall cake. The Ribble is certainly getting a better river. There's no question about this. How can you deny when, we'll say in the 1950s, there was a thousand fish coming in, and now there's 12 and coming up to 15. So we must be doing something right on the, on the Ribble. Mainly on any river system is the quality of water, the free passage of the fish, good spawning grounds and of course no matter how many fry or smolts we go into the sea if there's no food in the sea they won't come back so that's one of the biggest problems probably in the sea like I said before if all the salmon are eating the same apple well what we have to improve is the quality of uh, feed which is in the river the most famous saying of any fisherman it was Malak who wrote the interesting book in 1900 he once said there was nothing unusual to go into his fish house on the river Tay and count 40 40 pounders. And that's because we have more fish, or shall I say food, in the sea for the salmon to feed off. So I think that's one of the main ones is that the ribble system, I don't think we can improve the ribble system anymore, it's coming naturally, but we certainly need the food in the sea. And a further layer of difficulty gets added by the fact that when they enter fresh water, their urge to feed supposedly switches off. Not only that, they stop feeding probably uh, four to five weeks before they enter the, the river. But nature is very good because, let's face it, if we've got the number of fish which is entering the ribble system and they had to feed, in fact they wouldn't be there because they'd eat every small there is. So we'd never have uh, any salmon at all. So nature's made it that way that salmon and sea trout don't eat in fresh water. What is it then that makes them respond to anglers, lures and baits? Well, it's a nature response. Nature looks after itself quite good. The more, more we know about salmon fishing, or the salmon, I think it's detrimental to the salmon itself. But why did they grab at lures on the move or a worm drifting by if food isn't on their agenda in the river? It's probably territorial. In my time, I've actually noticed, especially the ones fishing small rivers on holidays, etc. But a salmon has two lies. 
I've noticed that when I were fishing in Scotland once that uh, I was disturbing the salmon, which would not take the bait, he moved. And then when I went down the pool, there was there, he was at the bottom of the pool, and I started fishing again, could see him, he moved away. So I think it's territorial, they did just get annoyed at the times, and I think if the water condition is just right at the right temperature, they'll have a snap at the lure or, or fly. Give us your take then on what the ideal salmon conditions would be. Yeah, when you're coming away from the river, you've caught four salmon. <laughs> it's really hard, that. Let's face it, you can have the ideal condition, it's a beautiful day, you have a good afternoon and you don't catch anything. To me, that's a good day's fishing. And then you can have the other where you just catch the odd uh, salmon or, or sea trout. I personally like a cloudy day, some breaking through just now and again, two days after a flood, and if there's a bit of drizzle, fair enough. That's my perfect day. Imagine yourself now walking along the riverbank looking for likely salmon holding lies to put a lure through. What actually are you looking for? Well, first of all, a pool which you think would hold salmon. I found out in my experience that uh, if the river, it will just say going down the river, if it's to run up half a mile to the next pool, then I think you have a good chance. If I had a stretch of river which were like four mile long, I'd fill every pool in, apart from the top one. So I'd start off at the neck, and when I send the neck, probably in the uh, the shallowest water. We have a, a lot of times, we, we really start 10, 15 feet lower than what we, we should do. And I've caught a lot, a lot of salmon in the neck of a, of a pool, the, we'll say a tail end. So, yeah, that's what I, I would do. And then, of course, if the river is very good trim and it's low and it's clear, then it's the salmon fly rod out. And on this perfect day, with no one else on the riverbank, what would be your favoured approach to fishing it? Well, a lure, it could be a spinning lure or a fly lure. The salmon flies which we use on rivers, well, they don't represent a fly at all. I do like, uh, I do like to fly fish, especially if the conditions are just right for fly fishing. I like a tube fly with a treble hook on. I think the tube fly is a very good one because it's never, never upside down. And my favourite is, is a stalk tail or the, the willy gun or the alley shrimp. If I was uh, only had the choice of these flies, I'd be quite happy to fish any river. Spinning, give me the black genie. Whereas when I said the black genie, this is the black one with the yellow inside. A nice silver blade or a blur spoon. So we've got uh, one flying sea, one blur spoon and three flies. I'm happy with them, and if I can't catch them on then, then they're not taken at all. Right, so we've got the lure and we've found a good pool. Where on that pool do you actually start, and what casting approach or pattern do you use to cover the entire surface area in volume available to be in with the best shot at the fish? Yeah, I do cast upstream and a lot of anglers do uh, do this, and uh, if it's the blur spoon we'll let it flutter down and the salmon hooks itself, and if uh, we're on the... Uh, on the salmon fly, I do have a tendency to start in a glade just above the salmon pool and work through the rapids because salmon like going into uh, rapids just at the neck of a pool and that's where I've caught most of mine and then of course there's always hot spots. We know by going to the same pool that we catch a salmon it's in a certain spot. Ten yards above it we don't catch, ten yards below we don't catch so we come to a hot spot and uh, that's where the salmon are lying, probably in uh, two, three foot of water, and probably behind uh, a rock. So there's an element of local knowledge involved here too? Yeah, it's down to local knowledge. This is why the ribble and things like that, we haven't got to the knowledge which has been handed down from our forefathers, where in Scotland they have. I mean, the maps on the river, and they'll point out or put across every old in place where a salmon will be hiding and they're all marked out for you, especially uh, on the river everything island, they just tell you where to go and where you're going to catch one. When we were chatting earlier, you mentioned the salmon playing situation which you have always tried to avoid, but when you accidentally found yourself in that situation recently, it turns out that you was actually better placed as a result. I have a very, very small stretch of water in the mid ribble round Solit. It's no more than uh, 35 yards so therefore I have to start at the head of the pool 
and I worked down th this and I've caught all the salmon within 10 feet of what I call the hot spot and this is where I try the uh, the lures out and this is where I fish to cover this pool believe it it takes me about 20 minutes and uh, I seem to catch quite a quite a number of, uh, of salmon in fact I, I wanted to just call my best salmon which was on the 30th of October of last year and it weighed in at 25 pounds and it was a cock fish which I returned in fact I've returned all my salmon I don't even take one these days so what exactly was this previously avoided salmon playing situation you found yourself in which this time you turned to your advantage I've come to the conclusion it's my belief that uh, a big fish is probably better below if this fish had a uh, had gone above me which then again I would have been in somebody else's uh, water and where I'm fishing I have to fish actually below rather than above and it was always below me now when I realized that the uke there was well in and I've always wanted to get down river of a fish but a big fish I'm convinced that if they're below you have more chance of catching because a big fish, you cannot turn it. I could not turn this 25 pounder. It did what it wanted to do, rather than what I want to do. And I have a feeling that if I had put side pressure onto him, I would have pulled the spoon out. It would have uh, come round the side of the mouth, and it, I think it would have come out. I'm not saying this on smaller fish, you know, 10 to 15. That's okay. If you can turn the head of the fish, no problem. But a big fish... I know in future that it's always going to be below me and the reason why I've done it once and I can't see why I can't do it twice. What is it then that makes one salmon angler not so much better but more successful than others on the same water under the same conditions? Time. I think everyone will uh, be a good salmon angler. I think practice and it's perfect. No matter what we do, if you do it three or four times and in salmon angling we'd probably do it 100 or 200 times we would all come up with the same uh, solution. So, what is a good salmon angler? That's a person who catches salmon and he's happy. Would you not also add to that the ability to go at the drop of a hat when conditions are perfect, rather than having to wait for weekends due to pressure of work? Oh, certainly, yeah. Like I say, okay, I, I probably caught four salmon a year. Now I can catch more, for the simple reason is I'm... Uh, on the 25 yard from the river, I can go there 10 minutes just before breakfast, 10 minutes before lunch, 10 minutes before tea, and of course just going at night time. So I can spend no more than an hour and a half, where normally I would have to spend 10, 20 hours to cover the same water and to be successful. So yes, definitely, him who lives on the river bank, I certainly got an advantage. And let's not forget having the right range of lures, which brings us back full circle. Because unlike a lot of people, if you see a situation where some slight modification to lure design is called for, you're in the position to do something about it. That's right. I have no secret to uh, lures. Every lure which I use myself is available to the, the angler. So I don't keep anything in my pocket if I come across another angler. And if slight tweaks and modifications do come to light during the course of your fishing, these two, I take it, are passed on to your customers. Yeah, it's, it's not a case of me, it's what they tell me. All these designs in which I do, I can start it off, but there's certainly the feedback which I get from anglers, they've made these spinners themselves. You're now 72 years old and still going strong at both your fishing and your lure making. What then does the future hold for Maurice Clarkson and for Spintech? It looks like I'm never going to retire. Which is good news for salmon anglers and hopefully less good news for the ribble salmon. My thanks then to Morris and to his son and partner Howard for putting the time to one side to record this interview in the course of what should have been a normal working day.